Good morning, everyone. I'm Roseanne Bump with Executive Director with FEI Twin Cities. I'd like to welcome you to our session today, Moving Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Forward with guest speaker Tawana Black from the Center for Economic Inclusion. This is a jointly sponsored event with FEI Twin Cities and NACD Minnesota. It's great to see all of our members, strategic partners, and guests here today. Please hold for a minute. Thank you. This session is eligible for 1.5 CPE today. For those looking for CPE credits, I need to confirm that you are on the call for a total of 75 minutes and that you are actively participating in the call today. So we are using the chat box to confirm participation. If you would like CPE, please open the chat box by clicking on the chat icon below Enter your first and last name and the word CPE in the chat box and then hit enter. For example, I would enter in Roseanne Bump CPE. So please go ahead and do that now if you would like CPE. In addition, there will be five more times during the session that I will uh, prompt you to enter in your name in the word yeah, CPE. There will not be verbal prompts today, so please leave your chat box open and look for those prompts. And please note it is important to enter your name each time so I can ensure I'm tracking the correct person. A couple of other housekeeping items to share. So please be sure to keep your camera off for today's se session. And if you are not muted, please go ahead and mute yourself. Also, any enter any questions you have for our speaker in the chat box throughout this session. We'll okay. be as many right. of those as possible near the end of this program. Yeah. I would like to take a moment to share a couple of FEI Twin Cities upcoming events. So next Tuesday, January 19th. Uh, we have a presentation on key tax yeah. considerations for 2021. Uh, this year will bring a new set of challenges and opportunities as businesses navigate the ongoing economic right. Yeah, I know that's what other companies are paying. Next. I've heard. Uh, tax yeah. So please join yeah, us in the team of tax professionals as we review evolving taxes. Was, it might have been more than and two. And then also on January 27th, we have a session yeah, on a year in review and what it means for you. This session yeah. will review the 2020 MA market and offer insights into what this year will look like. Also covered will be the impact of PPP well, it's an investment. and MA common challenges facing businesses and revenue recognition consideration. More information on FEI and all of our upcoming events can be found on our calendar at feitwincities.com. When I'm done with these comments, I'll go ahead and enter that URL into the chat box. And now I'd like to introduce NACD board member, John Bergstrom for a brief welcome, and then we'll go ahead and start the program. Uh, hello everyone. Uh Thanks for joining us in this virtual program. This is the uh, second in our series of back to business uh, programs. Uh, as noted, this, uh, this program is called Moving Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Forward. My role is as the president of our local NACD board. There's 20 chapters in the United States and our 20,000 member organization of corporate board members. Uh, just to, and, and we're pleased to present this today in conjunction with FEI Twin Cities. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things to go over. Uh, as, as you know, if you're an NACD member, we're very, uh, we, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on having survey results. Uh, so uh, as we've moved to these virtual events, we want to continue that and that you will see a link in the chat box uh, that will uh, prior to the end of the program, as well as in a follow-up email to respond. So please take the time to respond. Uh, we, we really take those comments seriously. Uh, just wanted to note some of our uh, board members uh, present. On the next slide, when it comes up, you'll see the list of our nine or 10 current board members. We just elected a couple of new people. Uh, several of these people are present today. Uh, myself, uh, Myron, uh, George, of course, who's Going to be our moderator. Uh, Dara Ruddick, one of our newest board members, is present today. 
uh, and Barbara Butts Williams is with us, as well as I believe John Stout, our emeritus chair. Uh, we also like to acknowledge our sponsors. We have five sponsoring organizations right now that are on the next slide. Clifton Larson Allen, Fredrickson and Byron, Grant Thornton, KPMG, and ProTivity. And I'm pleased to say that uh, I believe all or at least four of the five of those have representatives in this uh, session today. Um, uh, future programs, uh, we have, uh, oh, we, uh, this next slide is showing us uh, full board members. These are organizations that uh, have joined NACD uh, company-wide. That means all of their board members and management are part of our organization. And then we also have a significant number of individual board members of NACD and particip participating in this meeting are both types of members, individual and full board members. And then finally, uh, we've got our list of future programs. Uh, you can read those uh, there, keeping up with uh, uh, the digital revolution, back to business, that's our part three, uh, international growth in a new political era, sustainability and ESG reporting, and then a nonprofit board round table. These are all planned for the uh, second half of our academic year here. In other words, now through June, please refer to our website for more information and to register. So now I'd like to uh, uh, move to the program of the day. Uh, this program will be recorded. You can see the Zoom recording box in the upper left-hand corner or wherever it may appear on your screen. Uh, so it'll be available for future viewing as well. I'm pleased to introduce uh, George Boyages, who is a member of both uh, sponsoring groups boards, both NACD Minnesota and FEI Twin Cities. Uh, highly appropriate to be our moderator today. And George has the honor of introducing our featured speaker, Tawana Black. George. Uh, there we go. Had a little challenge with the unmute button this morning. Good morning. And on behalf of uh, George, you're muted. We'll try that again. All right, <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'm honored to serve as uh, the moderator for today's event and uh, welcome you to today's webinar entitled Back to Business, Moving Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Forward. Our format's a keynote follow-up by a fireside chat with moderated Q&A and because of the large number of attendees, again, we ask that you keep your microphone setting on mute and utilize the Zoom chat feature to post questions. For those of you in the audience who need CPE credits, as Roseanne mentioned, FEI will be providing those and we'll be using the chat function of Zoom as part of that record keeping. Our speaker is Tawana Black, founder and CEO of the Center for Economic Inclusion, the nation's first organization dedicated to advancing inclusive growth to achieve regional prosperity. As you all know, Minneapolis and St. Paul sit at the epicenter of a crisis felt worldwide in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and the bedlam following this horrific event. Protests have risen around the globe to advance racial equity, inclusion, justice, and respect. Many companies have adopted these goals and seek to move them forward, but they also want to know that their actions are making a difference. So our program today is designed to help us all better understand what are the key indicators of an inclusive economy and what can financial executives and board members do to advance inclusive growth and prosperity in the communities served by their companies. And so now it's my privilege to introduce Tawana Black. She's a nationally recognized thought leader known for influencing, inspiring, and providing business leaders and public sector leaders with the tools they need to transform a personal conviction for equality into actions that produce equitable and thriving communities. For more than 20 years, Tawana has led multi-sector collaboratives, triple bottom line diversity and inclusion strategy development, and economic revitalization organizations in Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and Minnesota. In 2017, Tawana launched the Center for Economic Inclusion 
the nation's first organization dedicated to creating inclusive regional economies, which seeks to equip public and private sector employers toward dismantling institutional racism, and building shared accountability for achieving inclusive economic growth. In addition to her role as founder and CEO of the center, Ms. Black is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution, and she serves on the board of the Opportunity and Growth Institute of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And if that's not enough to keep one person busy, because of her depth and breadth of knowledge about the tools, levers, and metrics around advancing inclusive growth, she was recently selected by 3M to help guide its five-year, $50 million investment in education and workforce development initiatives across the U.S. aimed at addressing racial inequities. In short, Tawana Black is an incomparable expert on achieving inclusive economic growth, period, full stop. And so while our lines are muted, please join me in offering a warm round of applause to welcome this morning's speaker, Tawana Black. Thank you so much, George, for that warm welcome. It's great to be here with all of you this morning and to have the opportunity to not only um, support the work that you are doing um, and be partnering with FEI, but to also be able to join the Twin Cities chapter of the National Association of Corporate Directors. A big warm welcome um, and thank you to um, all of you who have welcomed me to George, to Roseanne, John, and Sherry, and the entire FEI and NACD team uh, for the warm invitation to join each one of you on this morning. I'm grateful that you all are not only um, about the business of each one of your organizations and partnering together, but also are prioritizing this topic and prioritizing the opportunity to be back to business with a focus on racial equity and inclusion and what equity and inclusion can do for business. Certainly we believe and, and think at our organization that focusing on equity and inclusion can do just what it needs to be able to do for um, businesses and for regional economies and are focused on doing just that for our work um, at the center and want to be able to share that here with you today as I share um, not only our screen um, uh, and some materials with you, but also share a bit of a framework and some reflections about what we see and are experiencing here in Minnesota and across the country um, as we've all begun recognizing much more deeply with divisions and challenges that have divided us for quite some time, uh, but that we find um, a new reckoning with, I think, a new consciousness about um, over the last several months and years. So I'll jump into this um, presentation and discussion with you all and look forward to um, the Q&A and discussion with George uh, here in just a bit. In our work at the center, we have spent time over the last three plus years supporting businesses and public sector agencies throughout um, the region and the country and helping them really build a deeper, more inclusive and equitable civic infrastructure that helps us really disrupt the systems that for so long have been designed to benefit some and not engage others um, and really start to shift that, to change the policies and practices and ways that we go about our work in order to build an economy that truly does work for everyone. You might ask yourself, okay, why? Why begin this work? Why have one organization dedicated so exclusively to this work? And because we've got so many people um, at FEI who are about numbers and corporate directors are also, I find often focused on numbers, I thought I might share some numbers with you all um, to get us started. We focus on numbers quite a bit at the center. Those of you who have been in presentations with me before who have been at some of our events know that. And so some numbers that we think about today first start about leadership. In 2008, 8.6% of Fortune 500 board seats were occupied by black men and women, though they made up 12.3% of the overall population. In 2020, only 3% of Fortune 100 corporations were led by a Black chief executive, prompting a Stanford study to call the results and progress dismal, quite dismal, and calling for major changes to occur. Among nearly 19 million management positions in the US, only 8.4% were held by African Americans. 
since June of 2020, we've seen a drastic shift in that information. We've seen a number of large corporations, particularly here in the United States, but even globally, starting to have massive swaths of change happening, where we see African-Americans moving into leadership and executive positions at rates we can't even begin to keep up with. We see corporate directors changing rapidly, bringing more and more people of many diverse backgrounds into seats. This isn't about a change in talent. This isn't about a number of people suddenly getting more credentials than they had just six or eight months ago, but there is a sudden recognition that more diversity is necessary, and we hope a recognition that inclusion is necessary, that we have to take deeper action. Further, we find that nationally, the earnings gap of 40% and the wealth gap between Black and white Americans has not moved in 50 years, even when we norm for the differentiating factors that we tend to attribute those gaps to. While our minds tend to assume that those gaps we talk about often can be attributed to gaps in education and skills, studies find, studies from the Economic Policy Institute, McKinsey and others, find that even when we norm for those factors, the data doesn't move. Our actions as Americans, as leaders, as business leaders have not caused those statistics to move. And here in Minnesota, local actions have also failed. While we are a community of progressives, by and large, while we are a community of collaborators, by and large, we have not been able to get to the root of the matter of division, the root of the matter of racism. And in fact, we find that on average, our gaps in income between black and white workers who go to work in the same jobs every day and yet are paid up to 15 percentage points differently, we find that that actually, I'll correct that statement, that we find that they're paid drastically differently, that we haven't been able to move the needle on that data for more than 15 years. And in fact, our gap here in Minnesota between those workers and what they're paid is more than 15 percentage points wider than the US average with a gap of 55%. We here have an opportunity to get serious about division. What then do we do about it? Here at the center, we felt like there was an opportunity to begin tying inclusion to the economy to help leaders who have strong values of inclusion, who have a belief in equality, move that belief into action. We call it three A's, awareness, action, and accountability, beginning to speak a language that folks tend to understand. We see in the data here from the Brookings Institution that this failure to be able to get to the root of the matter about inclusion, equity, and belonging is not only now impacting those communities of color, but it's begun to impact our ability to compete with those cities and regions that are most important for us to compete with when it comes to talent, when it comes to creativity, innovation, and startup capital, when it comes to being able to attract the best of the best companies and the talent that they need to continue to fuel their businesses. When we compare ourselves not only to those corporations, and businesses, but also to our, our own ideals, our own beliefs about how we want communities and families thriving in our state. We also find that while we tend to make a little bit of progress here or there, we continue to fall back down. Just a few years ago, with some very intentional efforts at both the state and local level between public and private sector organizations, we saw ourselves making progress in narrowing the employment gaps but we weren't focused enough on thinking about who, what jobs those communities of color were being connected to. What the data shows us is that too often we were connecting communities of color directly into low wage paying jobs. We see this coming back out of COVID-19 that those jobs were the first jobs to be cut from the economy and are also the jobs that are not coming back. So now as we see the economy starting back up once again, we see that those communities of color, our BIPOC workers, are the workers who are not being hired back in. And if they are, they're being hired back at even lower wages than they were making pre-downturn in the economy. This, again, doesn't only impact those communities, but impacts our entire ability to thrive as a region. And this is happening in regions all across the country. Nationally, you see these charts look similar 
but not nearly as drastic as we find here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and yet causes opportunities for concern, and better than that, opportunities for action. That said, this isn't only about disparities. It isn't only about those people, which unfortunately is a bit of the way that we've gone about solving for this historically. McKinsey finds that ethnic diversity correlates with stronger profitability. That is the news that we come to bring. But that news also requires action, not only thinking about the number of seats that we need to fill, but how we fully leverage the talent once we bring that diverse talent into the boardroom, once we bring more diverse talent into the C-suite, how we leverage that talent, not just to check the box, not just to assume that we've diversified the circle, but how we ask people to bring their full selves into the workplace and then leverage that diversity in ways that maximize the bottom line and maximize their contributions. What we find is that too many employers don't know how to do that. When surveyed just over the last three years by Accenture about whether or not their efforts to build inclusive organizations were working, we found that most employers, supervisors, feel that they are that they're working as hard as they can to foster inclusion, to build workplaces where people feel included and feel like they can bring their full selves to the workplace. But when their employees are surveyed, they found a contrast in that. Only one third of employees actually believed what their employers were selling them. 20% of employees felt like they were excluded and weren't fully welcomed in the workplace. Beyond that, when we look at what is being left on the table, by our failure to get to the root of the matter, it's significant. If we close that gap in perception between those who believe I'm doing everything I can to foster inclusion, to convince you that you're fully welcome here, and those who say, you don't actually know what I need to feel welcomed here. You don't know what it means for me to bring my full self to the workplace, and therefore you haven't created that for me. If we close that gap in perception just by 50% here in the United States, it would impact the United States economy by more than $1 trillion. That's a number we should all care about. And the good news is there are meaningful actions that leaders inside businesses can do from the boardroom to the front door to start to get those dollars flowing through our economies. The way that we approach that is by first starting to be sure that we all understand what an inclusive economy is and what one is not. Today, if we don't have an inclusive economy, that means we have an exclusive economy. So we have to be concrete about those definitions. What does it mean for everyone to have access to opportunity? We use that word a lot to say, I want everyone to have opportunity. And it sounds good. It makes the heart feel good. But how do we define that? We define that using indicators that come from the Rockefeller Foundation's Indicators for an Inclusive Economy, that everyone has access to participate in markets, both as workers, consumers, and as business owners, recognizing that there is a lot in our history that has precluded all of us from being able to operate in all three of those lanes. And therefore, we must start to put policies in place that are just as intentional as those in our history were at exclusion, now we must be just as intentional today at inclusion to ensure that everyone can participate in each of those three lanes because we recognize business ownership, consumerism, and being a worker or employee creates different avenues for real opportunity, economics, and wealth building. Second, we think about upward mobility. This generation that we're raising today is said to be potentially the first that will not have an opportunity to do better than their parents economically. We have an opportunity, again, to be serious and reckon with the behaviors and actions and policies that we've put in place that have caused that, and to begin to be serious about addressing those policies, undoing the racism within our policies, undoing the economic burdens within our policies, so that upward mobility is inclusive and equitable. And this takes place not only in public policy, but also in business, ensuring that everyone can advance their careers, accumulate wealth, and make long-term investments with confidence in the future. Do your employees understand how the economy is changing? 
Do they understand what careers will and won't exist in the next 10 years? Not only your executive and leadership employees, but those frontline employees whose jobs your company depends on. Are they informed about the way that automation and augmentation are going to impact their careers? Are they able to take advantage of opportunities now to upskill and reskill so that they can continue to be a part of the next economy, the new economy? And are they in control of some of those decisions while being informed by the employer? And lastly, we look at increased empowerment. Everyone has an opportunity in this case of an inclusive economy to drive economic growth in their own communities. Imagine a place where we didn't think about those neighborhoods that we avoid because they're so lacking of economic growth and prosperity that other ills have crept in and taken over. Economics are directly tied to social ills that we turn a blind eye to. But economics can also repair those ills when people have an opportunity to drive economic growth in their own communities through their own terms with innovation and new business creation. At the center, we help businesses leverage these three facets in the decisions they have control over every day inside their organizations through a number of domains that I'll discuss in a moment. But that requires what we believe are three core facets in the decisions that each one of us make. Decisions, data, and approaches that are different than many of us have been trained to do, sometimes trained formally, sometimes trained innately through the cultural programming that we have. These solutions that we begin to deploy require three new lenses. A lens first that says, how do we take policies and begin to craft them in ways that are about centering the very populations that we have either excluded or left on the margins in our policies to date. When we think about our policies around procurement, who we purchase from, what businesses we prioritize in our supply chain, we will not get to an equitable economy by occasionally including a business that is owned by a person of Latin descent, by occasionally including another couple of vendors who are restaurants or, or food surveyors of African-American descent. We may get there by being exclusively intentional about including enough Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian vendors in order to ensure that those same vendors are adding family sustaining jobs at significant rates in their own communities, in their own businesses, alongside the growth that we're seeing in large corporations as they diversify. We have to be just as intentional about inclusion and equity as our country has been and our businesses have been historically about exclusion. And that requires centering those very populations and centering racial equity. We also have to make sure secondarily that our solutions are data informed. There's a wide amount of data that exists that can inform our solutions. Often we have the reports and they run alongside our solutions but don't actually inform them. We work with businesses and policymakers every day to make sure that when we have the data, we are accountable to the data. Not that it's the only thing that informs the solutions, but that it's a significant driver in informing those solutions and in helping us change the solution when it's not working. Doing so in a reasonable amount of time so that we can continue to drive meaningful change. And thirdly, being market responsive. For a very long time, these concepts you see on the screen, economic development, workforce development, transportation, housing solutions, we've operated in those lanes with lots of silos. In this diagram, you see there aren't any closed boxes because each of these domains have to be intersectional in the way that each one of us live our lives today. But we also have to apply lenses of race, place, and income to everything that we do in order to ensure that we truly build that economy that works for everyone. We do all of that in partnership with employers and policymakers in this lane of committing to driving meaningful dismantling change and reasonable change that's going to build an economy that works for everyone, but with a lens specifically toward ensuring that we're closing not only racial employment gaps or education gaps, 
but income gaps and ultimately wealth gaps, knowing that when we close those wealth gaps and address historic wealth extraction, we'll ensure that all communities thrive and ultimately that our entire economy thrives. The opportunities that we have in front of us are boundless and ultimately impact every single person in our economy and in our region here in Minnesota. The way that we're going about that at the center is by helping leaders like yourselves understand that we can't heal racism until we address just that, racism. And that requires us becoming anti-racist. For a long time, many of us have been taught that if we're good people, if we have good hearts and we believe in this work and we're nice to people who are different than us, then we'll be able to achieve the work that we want to achieve and not have impacts that are negative, that hurt other people. And that's a good concept. It's one that we wish was able to work. But unfortunately, we have too many policies working against us for that to be successful. Getting an economy that works for everyone, addressing the ills that we've experienced, not only here in Minnesota, but across our country, particularly the last year, but for years and years and decades before, requires each one of us waking up every day and saying, what am I going to do today that is anti-racist? How am I going to see the decisions that come across my desk today? that come throughout my neighborhood today, that come in every place and space that I am in. How am I going to look at those in a way that says, are people who are like me or different than me impacted in ways that they shouldn't be? And what actions can I take that help bring a different lens to that? How can I make sure that there are racially equitable outcomes that come from this? We as an organization work to support leaders in those efforts to ensure that here in this region, we set goals through our anti-racism and economic justice trust that help us move the needle on the things that are important, that we measure those things that count, that we measure them well, we measure the work that we're doing that leads to change in those areas. In this case, we're zeroing in with a laser-like precision on addressing those wage gaps that I spoke of earlier, recognizing we won't get there simply with public policy or with corporate action, or with changes that happen in communities of color. It will take all of the above and then some. And so we bring partners across all sectors together to work on these things, not just elbow to elbow or shoulder to shoulder, but hand in hand, knowing that we all have to be at the table bringing everything that we've got in order to undo more than 400 years worth of disinvestment, wealth extraction, and racism built into our systems and to double down on the hope and prosperity that exists today. We bring to the table targets that can help business leaders and policymakers work hand in hand with communities to not only address those stagnant gaps we spoke of before, but to also stimulate our regional GDP and meet overall business goals because these things go hand in hand. We know they go hand in hand because it takes each one of us working hand in hand together, and because we've developed indicators for an inclusive regional economy over the last several years and monitored the data with leaders, with policymakers, with researchers to understand how every piece of our economy fits together, but more than that, to understand what specific indicators we need to monitor in order to ensure that not only are some parts of our economy moving forward, but that all parts of that economy are moving forward. The commitment that we bring to that is to foster shared accountability, to instigate changes in the narrative through data-informed opportunities and by helping all of us understand how this laser-like action can drive real economic return and how it relates to the hard work that also must be done. By equipping employers and policymakers with the tools and resources that are needed, because as we shared earlier in the data, today it's clear many of us don't have the tools to know what to do or how to do it. And then by connecting sectors, employers, community leaders and businesses together so that we can do this work arm in arm. We ask employers and policymakers to do the work of co-creating anti-racist policies, approaches and strategies, moving out of the place of silos 
into the place of true co-creation and partnership and recognizing that we won't solve any of this in one year or three years. So we have to be committed to be in this work together for a long time, but that together we can do this if we're monitoring that work year after year. To share power and recognize that ultimately power is at the heart of a lot of the pain that we've been in for some time, but sharing power is also at the heart of the solutions and hope that we're seeking to achieve. And to establish goals because like any good strategy, what gets measured does get done. And for too long, we've thought that this work could not be measured, but in fact it can. And when we invest responsibly to the goal we're trying to achieve, we can actually apply real tools to it and see meaningful change in an accelerated manner. The indicators that I referenced earlier are available on our website. You can map that data and understand it down to the level of a census tract across the entire seven county metro. More than that, there are tools and solutions that we can bring to bear in any business to help take these regional indicators and the indicators of household financial security down to a more fine level inside a business by using our proprietary racial equity dividends assessment that helps employers understand what's happening with your employee base and what actions can you take now and over time to see changes both inside your organization and retention development, how you attract talent, how you attract businesses to buy things from and how you invest in communities for long-term sustainable change and how you ultimately impact building a more inclusive regional economy, whether that's here in Minnesota or other cities and communities that you may work in in your business. This work is about how we move from that stage of being more conscious of what's happening in our communities, feeling the pain about what's happening in our communities, to moving to doing new, meaningful, deep action in partnership with one another in a place of shared accountability and ultimately being accountable to our communities. We work with employers to make meaningful commitments that move us from the places that we might have been with good diversity and inclusion strategies to being finely detailed in our racial equity and inclusion strategies that tie to the business and bottom line. We saw that just prior to George Floyd's murders, diversity and inclusion positions were being cut at more than 40% across the country. And now we've seen a huge influx again in those positions being created by many major global corporations across the country. The importance of the work did not change in the few months between April and today but the pain and reckoning did. If we're not certain about what goals we want to achieve, and if those goals are not data informed and tied to the business, we will be in the same position again in just a couple of years. The data over the last 50 years tells us that. Leaders like yourselves have an opportunity to embed these principles of data informed action and centering the communities that have been excluded and tying it to the business through market responsiveness to ensure that's not the case. And we're an organization who works to ensure you have a partner to do just that. This work of anti-racism is possible. It's not just a new cliche. It can't be just a new cliche, but it is a new way of thinking and approaching the data. And these actions can have sustained impact on workplaces, household financial security, and the ultimate economy. This takes acting in a number of different ways. And these are six ways that we act alongside both the clients that we have as the business and the community partners that we have as a community-based organization here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, in order to ensure that we ultimately are pulling as many levers as we possibly can to ensure that our communities thrive, our economy thrives, and the businesses that we're serving thrive and that we ultimately close racial wealth gaps and close our gaps in understanding and belonging to be the community and the people that we aspire to be. Ultimately, the choice is ours about who we want to be, how we want to be, and whether or not we can live up to it. I wake up every day alongside my amazing team and board and investors believing that it's absolutely possible and in relentless pursuit of an economy that works for everyone. And I'm grateful that you all invited me here today for this conversation, because I believe that you think it is possible as well. Thank you. And I look forward now to the conversation with George. 
Well, Tawana, thank you so much. Uh, we, we've had lots of great questions coming in um, during, uh, during the conversation. Uh, it, you know, one of the things that, that you know, it uh, occurs to me is that it seems like such a huge challenge, right? And we're all individuals. What, and and you've, you've laid out a number of different strategies and so forth. But in listening to some of your comments, not just today, but over the years, you, you've really convicted me that individuals can do little things that really achieve, help to achieve significant differences. Um, I'll give you the example. I've got two words on the top of my uh, computer screen. Think first. Okay. You inspired me to do that, Tawana. Okay. Because what think first means to me is think first about the things that I can do to help achieve some of these objectives. And, you know, none of us wake up necessarily in the morning thinking about how we're going to be uh, racist or having uh, uh, bias as part of our, uh, you know, persona, but it's those anti-racist type of uh, activities that we can implement. And so it can be as simple as, as thinking first about, you know, the connections we can make, the introductions we can make, uh, the hiring decisions we make, some of those sorts of initiatives. So, um, so we, you know, I, I just want to thank you for inspiring me uh, to do that, and and um, uh, hopefully you've, you've inspired many in the audience to do that as well. I love that. Think first, um, uh, George. I have uh, similar notes all around uh, here myself. I write uh, to myself regularly, and I think that's the one of the beauties of this work is that it's a lifelong journey for every single person. And I think often um, I speak to audiences who hear me speak and think, okay, she's just speaking to us. Um, I'm a minister in another part of my life. And in every sermon, I tell people I'm talking to Tawana first um, uh, and then I'm speaking to the audience. Like I, it has to come to the preacher first. And the same is true for equity and inclusion. Each one of us have to have those things that we put up to say, wait a minute, I, this is a personal journey. I've got to do the pause. I've got to think first. And when I get it wrong, because we're all going to get it wrong um, sometime, self-included, then it's it's part of the journey to do that reconciling, um, but to not come out of the game because I got it wrong, but to stay in the game and keep learning and going. So one, one of the questions that uh, came in, um, in, in, in sectors like construction or the trades, electric, uh, HVAC, and so forth, um, how are small business owners of, of diverse backgrounds being supported by government or industry to be able to compete with the larger corporate service providers? Institutions, companies have vendor screening criteria that, that often exclude smaller entities because they may not have the same legal structure, insurance coverage, and so forth. What are some of your ideas or thoughts in, in that realm? Yeah, I really appreciate that. I think that's a, uh, an area where there's still room to go. I think certainly we've seen on large government projects uh, where our government certainly is in a position to be able to support those entities in getting the bonding assistance or technical assistance that might be needed in order to come on to a very large job or structuring the contracting and deals such that large firms are incentivized to be able to bring on those smaller firms and or to be able to have a qualifier on for um, firms owned by Black or Indigenous or Latinx or Asian firms or um, women-owned firms. That said, rarely are those same qualifiers put on privately funded and invested um, projects, right? And so even um, some of the best large firms say, wait a minute, have we done the assessment to be sure that we have the same goals and, and commitment over here in our privately funded projects that we do publicly? And there aren't a lot of um, public uh, carryovers in terms of the support. I think that's an idea. One thing I think we have seen, excuse me. Um, one thing I think we have seen um, some of the public sector agencies doing is doing their own audits about where they've been successful in supporting those small businesses and where they've been harmful and then addressing that. An example I would give is um, while we see the success stories often of inclusion, um, we don't often see that sometimes the public sector payment terms are such that it can still put a small business out of business if it takes 
um, 90 days, um, 120 days to get paid. And we've had projects in the Twin Cities that have done just that. Um, so we've seen both the state of Minnesota, some of the counties um, doing some audits over the last couple of years to ensure that they're not just inclusive on the front end, but their terms are also inclusive and equitable enough for those businesses to stay long-term because that sets them up to be able to do business with private sector firms. Great. So, you know, one of the things that um, big companies get a lot of attention in, in this effort, in, in this initiative, right? In, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, there were 50, 75 different companies here in the Twin Cities, CEOs, chairs, who were uh, talking about what their company was going to do differently now, differently today. Big companies, they've got uh, DNI leaders, all of those sorts of things. Speak to a moment for a moment to some of the initiatives that small companies can do. You know, small professional service companies. How can how can those those organizations uh, make an impact? Absolutely, great question. I think first is acknowledging the need for inclusion and mid small size companies. Um, it doesn't take a large HR department or having a, a diversity and equity leader designated in order to make an impact, but it does take being committed to the work of inclusion and equity um, and then acknowledging that. We've seen um, impact in gig jobs and I think FEI actually partnered with us um, for our gig economy inclusion um, forum just in last year's um, session. And one of our partners um, is a smaller business or a large corporation, but their outfit here is rather small and all of their, um, the, not all, but a large majority of their jobs are gig jobs, but they wanted to be inclusive. And so they said, how can the center partner with us? And what we ended up doing was surveying their employees and then found that they had really good benefits. The benefits were the driver for people to come in. And so they crafted it where you could still be part-time, which is what they needed people to be, but you could get benefits and they made their benefit package attractive enough that part-time workers could still get that. And so it was a win-win. So there are things that you can do to say, who's the target audience for our jobs? Um, what are those folks facing? And how can we make sure that there are things we can adapt inside our organization that are going to be inclusive? and understand what are those barriers that get in the way? Is it location? And if so, are there things you can do to partner with Met Council on, for instance, um, for transportation? Transportation, childcare, and, and housing are the biggest barriers for any business. Um, they're also the biggest barrier for any worker. So are there things that you can do to partner up as a smaller mid-sized business with community-based organizations and public sector agencies to address those? And as small and mid-sized businesses, there are many opportunities that often go unnoticed and unclaimed simply because you don't know, but partners like us and the community partners we work with, we're here to serve because it behooves us to connect those dots. So I would say lean on us, let us know, hey, we've got this number of openings and we're struggling or turnover, but we could benefit from that connecting of the dots and we're committed to inclusion and then let us partner with you. Thank you, the, uh, great, great ideas, Tawana. I mean, you know, F FEI started on our diversity and inclusion journey back in, in 2012 here in the Twin Cities. And uh, that, that happened because there were, there were two of us who, who looked at each other, my, my colleague who happened to be African-American myself, we looked at each other, two board members, and said, who do we know who could be potential uh, uh, members of, of a BIPOC community who could be a me member of FEI? And we said, well, there's really just two. I mean, <laughs> there, there were, and so, and so over the course of time, we've now identified over 125 people who are leaders in the BIPOC communities to help us make connections and introductions to uh, professionals of color. Uh, uh, we, we're making, um, we're collaborating with the National Association of Black Accountants, the Association of Latino Professionals in Finance and Accounting, uh, and, a, and a variety of others. But it's it's all about being intentional and starting on the journey and and those sorts of those sorts of issues. Um, okay, uh, moving on to to another question. Um, along it, it's it's the issue of diversity versus inclusion. Okay, uh, the the uh, uh, the the questioner writes a longstanding challenge that that I've experienced in the corporate setting has been getting minority populations to feel welcome. Many instances where efforts to recruit someone of color with needed skills to MSP ultimately failed because those recruited never really felt included or welcomed. 
Besides affinity groups, what actions did, uh, would you recommend that organizations take to address that issue of inclusion? Mm -hmm. This is a, a challenge and I uh, can relate to this challenge as someone who's been a trailing spouse uh, following her husband around the country for 23, 24 years uh, uh, now and came to Minnesota with that and it's 11 years and I'm still counting. So I can relate to that one um, quite a bit. Um, uh, I think there are our, the first thing is to acknowledge um, and to acknowledge it up front. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see, particularly corporate settings make, is to acknowledge it right out of the gate with employees of color and then do nothing except depend on outside sources and campaigns and initiatives to address it. If you have affinity groups, often those affinity groups know exactly what is happening that is causing exclusion and the feelings of exclusion and it's causing employees to not want to live in Minnesota. And yet their employers are doing everything around the edges, but nothing in the center. So when I use that phrase center racial equity, center the populations that are being excluded, it is not a light phrase. If I, when I did these workshops in person, I drew it on a flip chart so people could really get it that historically we have centered white males and next white females. And then you draw the concentric circles, right? And then you have BIPOC populations clear on the outside circle. What I'm telling you is your strategies, your philanthropy, your public policies, all those things that your corporation is doing in order for people to feel included, it's not only about sending those employees through a program or leadership Minneapolis or leadership St. Paul, sending them and telling, giving them the list of where the salons are and the restaurants and the churches, because that's what we tend to do. And then sending them now to greater MSPs, make it MSP. But it's about all the things that they see in the community that send 10 messages that, wait a minute, we're not actually included here. It's how your corporation gets involved in the things in this community that say, wait a minute, there are lots of us's and thems and that that's okay. That's the biggest thing you can do because you could give me a list all day long and I can go here and get my, get my nails done and go here and get my hair done and go there and go to church and still go back home in a nice suburban house and feel completely lonely and be longing for the last city I lived in where there was unity and inclusion. It doesn't matter once I find out the list if I still feel that and every time I open the newspaper, the people who look like me are being hurt and maligned and called things that they shouldn't be called. And so the more your business can show its hand and its commitment to not just liking me and me as, a, as the exception, but really having its hands about the work of building an equitable and inclusive community, the more those employees are going to truly feel inclusive, the more your corporation can be committed to helping your supervisors root out racism and exclusion inside your business, the more your employees will buy that. Go back to that Accenture data. Supervisors, leaders, executives feel like we're doing it. We're living it. And your employees are saying, not so much. <laughs> You've got to figure out what's that gap between effort and inclusion, intent and impact. And it's yeah. hard stuff. It doesn't feel good, but that's the real work. Yeah. And, and it takes uncomfortable conversations sometimes. Absolutely. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I had one of those uncomfortable conversations uh, when... Um, <sighs> When actually I, I was talking to two black professionals that I know, and I was talking about you, Tawana, and I said, you know, Tawana Black is, she's this amazing individual. They, neither of these two people had met you. I said that, you know, she's one of the most articulate people I know about the, the, the challenge of economic inclusion. And I got two death glares on the other side of the table. I had no idea that by using the word articulate, that that was a, micro, a microaggression. Right, because oftentimes people hear that as uh, articulate for a black person, mm -hmm. or, or and, and I, th thankfully, they they um, helped me understand something that I had no idea I was uh, a, a contributing to a microaggression. Okay, and, and I raised that on this conversation so that people can understand that there are things that people do. Right that end up being microaggressions, right. but it's all part of learning. And, and I would never have learned that if I hadn't had that uncomfortable conversation 
with my two black colleagues across the table. And I thank them for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so in that same vein, one of the questions that came up was, you know, we often focus on representation on our boards and our leadership teams and so forth. And no question that's important. Representation matters. But the, the questioner uh, uh, indicates that it strikes her that we as business leaders who were raised in a racist society could use some tools to work on ourselves first. And so what tools would you recommend to start that work that we need to do as leaders? One of the commenters after that had mentioned the Harvard implicit bias test as a good tool to begin or advance the conversation. And, let, uh, and uh, thankfully, the, they had a URL link to the Harvard implicit bias test. Uh, would like to know your thoughts on, on uh, uh, some of the tools to uh, start practicing anti-racist behavior, learning about it uh, yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you, um, Dara. That's a great question. Um, I appreciate the context and setup that you gave, George, for that. Um, it's so real and meaningful, and it's wonderful when friends are comfortable enough to be able to raise that, because so often we don't, um, or there's fear embedded in being able to call that out, and so we just leave and tell a friend, and so I love that that happened. Um, for that question, I agree that often we need both. We need representation to increase, but we have to be cultivating inclusion and equity at the same time, or we're just fostering a, a revolving door um, of folks coming in and out. I would definitely, um, I would ditto Mike Anders um, listing the Harvard Implicit Bias Test um, is a great one. I would come behind that. Uh, many people in Minnesota and organizations in Minnesota have used the IDI, um, which is a comparable um, institutional tool for um, the, uh, to the Harvard Implicit Bias Test. I would say the IDI is good only if you then have a consultant who can help you do the work both personally and institutionally after. I've seen it um, not be so great when people don't know what to do after they get the results and are left with the what. I would say though, the work of anti-racism is key. And I think Ibram Kendi's work in that space, if you haven't read his book on that, I would encourage that. I also think if you just went to the TED Talk um, uh, he's done a really meaningful TED Talk here recently, um, and I'll get that link so that when this is um, distributed, it comes out to you. Um, but he's done a really recent um, TED Talk, maybe in the last three months, that I have encouraged um, many white um, leaders and friends who are trying to also share this with their friends um, to watch and share about how and why it is critical to move from this place of I'm not racist to am I anti-racist? because they're two very different things. And getting a good understanding about that and then saying, okay, maybe now I'm ready to read the book um, and I'm ready to start thinking about what those practices and ideals look like so that when then the opportunity comes, I know how to practice that, um, I think are excellent resources and um, certainly um, work with us uh, as another opportunity. Very good, thank you. So, you know, one of the questions that was uh, provided um, uh, you know, was raised in the context of uh, George Floyd's killing and immediately following that, how many businesses pledged to increase their understanding of racism, increasing a BIPOC workforce, those sorts of issues. But the question really focuses on accountability, okay? How do we leverage the personal institutional power that each of us hold in our companies and, and become more accountable and move the needle on closing racial wealth and justice, justice gaps. Yeah, that's a significant, uh, a significant opportunity. Every leader um, has a major opportunity to drive accountability. And one of the things that I elevate frequently is the role of personal agency. That for a long time um, in my private practice before creating the center, um, and certainly in my center work, um, I'm in rooms with uh, folks who say, well, but it's not, that's not my job. Like, how can I do that? Um, and I stress every person has the role and opportunity um, and need to do this. My children are young. My, I waited late in life to do this parenting thing. And so my children are um, seven and nine, and they are equipped to be able to inform their teachers when something is not right. When my daughter read, uh, I just overheard her speaking about a civil rights lesson the other day about the civil war. And I am not good at history at all, but I knew well enough that what she had was not correct. And so when on my way out the door, I was like quickly, uh-uh, here, 
find two books on this shelf about the Civil War. And when I get back, have a report that will help you inform your teacher. So if nine-year-olds can be responsible for this, then all of us as adults have a responsibility for becoming advocates and voices for. It doesn't mean we speak for communities um, or even for our own community, but it does mean that we have an agency to be able to take on these issues and that it cannot, even if you are in a corporation working or on the board of a corporation that has a diversity and equity department of 25, it cannot be that department's sole job. It must be the job of every leader in the business. It must be the job of the board. And the board must ask about those metrics for equity and inclusion in the same way that it drives the decisions about the PL. Or it's not serious because they're inextricably tied. They are inextricably tied. And so we must be asking those questions and asking for them more than annually because we have, particularly here in Minnesota, we have looked at the indicators on an annual basis and we have played as though we are surprised that they have not improved. That does not make sense. That's cognitive dissonance. Then we, have done, we haven't done anything that would make them improve that is meaningful. As business people, we would know that, right? As policymakers, we would know that. So when we get serious about asking those questions and saying what resources did we put to that and were the resources relative to the significance of the problem or not, then people will feel empowered to make changes. And I'll give you an example. Often I go into businesses who have a talent problem or they have a heart connection to the issues of talent in North Minneapolis or the east side of St. Paul. But when I talk to HR, HR knows exactly why they have significant turnover, why people are quitting. They know all of the detail and data and they pour it out very easily. And I say, wait a minute, this is a finance issue. Have you talked to the CFO? Well, no, I can't do that. Either I'm scared to, or I don't think they would ever help me. I, I, they've got 10 reasons why they haven't done that. And I say, you don't need a, a college. You don't need a training organization. You need a meeting with the CFO. And we spend another 12 months doing every study on earth, every program on earth, except doing what needs to be done before then we come back and do the meeting that needs to be done. So as leaders, you've gotta be in a space where you get so serious about this that you use the data in order to drive decisions, not charity, not we feel bad for those people, but the data and what's right in front of you. And yes, it is also about people, but there is very little about driving an equitable and inclusive business and economy that is about the heart that isn't also backed up about data. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the key statistic to take in to, uh, to have that person take into their CFO, uh, close the gap by 50% and that's a $1 trillion impact nationally. What would our piece be in our company, period? Right there. Okay. And, uh, you know, any CFO ought to be paying attention to those sorts of issues, right? So um, moving on to another question here, um, but, but it speaks to the indicators, uh, right? It, you know, at the center, you outlined 14 different indicators of an inclusive economy. And as I was thinking back to the, um, you know, the statistics that you shared with us, many of them ended, uh, they were last measured in 2018, okay, for, you know, obvious reasons, and we're, we're a few years behind or maybe 2019. But here we are starting 2021 after an impossible year of 2020 on so many different dimensions. So what are you um, anticipating that those indicators are going to say uh, and what should we be doing as a result of where those indicators are leading? Yeah, great question. Um, great question. So the indicators, the data for most of them is released in December each year. Um, and we, um, as some of you may know, we do our annual summit in December um, and just finish that. And we toyed hard with, do we release data again at this stage? Do we not? And the reality is COVID-19 had such a significant impact on many of those indicators uh, that it skewed data. Again, when we look at the census, um, uh, the updates to the census data um, on many of those variables um, significantly, that it uh, is leaving many of us as researchers, not only here in Minnesota, but across the country, asking questions about what uh, indicators do we follow? Not that the 14 aren't still the right um, measures, but how do we monitor this data almost on a monthly basis while we also look at those annual measures to look at sustainable impact? 
in March, the Brookings Metro Monitor will be released, which are the indicators that I showed at the very beginning of the presentation. And I don't doubt that from a competition standpoint, when we compare ourselves to other regions across the country, um, which is one of our first uh, primary objectives, that we will be in comparable situations to where we were last year in terms of um, have we made um, Im measured improvement from the wage gap perspective. There's no reason to expect that we would have. We have seen more than 50% of African Americans file for unemployment since April in our state. The vast majority have um, not returned to work while we've seen some improvement in that in the last 90 days. Um, almost all have returned to very low wage paying jobs while we have seen very little impact uh, to white unemployment and the vast majority have returned back to um, well paying jobs. Um, when we look at Native American unemployment, again, well over 40% have filed for unemployment in the state and the same um, path follows in terms of where the wages are. Um, women, um, as we, I'm sure you all have seen uh, nationally, um, have taken the biggest brunt of the hit for unemployment uh, throughout the country. So we expect to see the same thing from a wage perspective for businesses, small businesses, the vast majority of businesses that um, will not come back um, are those businesses that are owned by our BIPOC communities. Um, uh, those businesses who did not um, fare well in the first round of uh, supports from our federal government. Um, those businesses who um, were banked, but were not banked with strong enough relationships that they were able to navigate um, uh, those relationships when it was time to be able to compete and where lottery systems um, in our cities and counties for additional resources still did not allow them to fare well. So I don't doubt that we are going to see ourselves be in very similar positions again um, from a, a, a regional versus national perspective. And more than that, when we look at just what COVID-19 has done across the country to families, all of us are uh, by the vast part at home working you have um, low wage workers means um, those folks on the front lines needing to also care for families, um, many more um, single earner households, um, uh, but also caring for more children per household, um, many more multi-generational households um, in um, many of our immigrant communities. The economic impact of that, um, while many of us saw the screen believing like, okay, well, we're getting more unemployment benefits, is that helping? Helping, yes, but then there are lots of other impacts that go behind that. So when we look at our indicators, you could pull the screen back up, housing, rental affordability, right? Um, loans going out, there's so many different variables, education levels, all those things fit together to make one big picture of our economy. And one good population of our economy is hit um, in many different ways and was already far behind the starting line when it comes to income equity and wealth equity, and it's just continuing to take major hits. I don't think we'll know the full impact of just COVID-19 for far in the future. When we marry that with then the impacts of a nation reckoning with the depths of racism, as we all had some level of wake up in the last nine months. While we've seen, yes, an increase of African Americans placed on boards and some in executive positions, none of that in a year is enough to do major impacts to the gaps in income um, or wealth at a, at a national scale or to change inclusion and belonging. Um, and so I don't think we'll see it in the indicators. Where I do hope we start to see it is in some of those perceptions around hope. When surveyed by the National Academy of Sciences and other publications a year ago, two years ago, the gaps in understanding and belief about race between Blacks and whites was drastically different. What we believed we experienced in our communities was drastically different. What we believed was happening with police was drastically different. Corporations, drastically different. I believe as we study that in 2021 nationally and here, we'll see some changes in that. The question is, will what our eyes have seen change what we do? When surveyed this summer, most white individuals said, while I am pained 
I have not taken any action. I might have given a donation, but I haven't taken any action. Those are studies from the Pew Research Center. So in 2021, if we want different results, those stats have to change. And I am hopeful, because that's who I have to be to do this work, that that will change. Tawana, that's, that's part of the reason I've got those two words on the top of my computer screen. I spend more, you know, I'm either talking with people in person or in this COVID world, it's, it's so much, you know, virtual and Zoom and things like that. But that's why I have those two words at the top of my screen. Think first. It, it convicts me every day. And I would encourage everyone in the audience to have similar kinds of tools to implement similar kinds of tools to really uh, uh, take action and, and go from being, uh, you know, uh, from understanding the issue to actually acting on the issue. So a um, question came up, uh, a firm that this uh, gentleman serves uh, uh, with has instituted the, the Rooney Rule for all supervisory management executive and even for future board positions, not as a formal stated policy, but by consensus. And so uh, it's a sign of the commitment to ensure diverse candidates are sought and seriously considered. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, I think it's positive. I think it's a positive step in the right direction. I've seen groups, even um, a symphony, uh, years ago I had the symphony in another city as a client in my personal practice and uh, they were trying to figure out similarly how to do blind auditions uh, with a Rooney rule in order to ensure that equity and inclusion were as embedded as they possibly could be. And we're really working to get really creative. And that came from their board saying, okay, wait, we've, we've got to figure this out. We need to be inclusive and, and doing similar things on a nonprofit board side, right? To say, okay, how do we not make this as tied to the donor giving and yet include some things? I think anything that we can do um, that helps us break out of our own thinking, to your point of think first, then it's the next layer of how do I challenge those things that are so embedded in my first thought of, set of thinking to also say, okay, wait a minute, but, but where did that thinking come from? Um, and the Rooney Rule can help us do that to say, okay, wait a minute, if somebody is in charge of ensuring that the slate um, is, is fully inclusive, right? That says, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's plan early enough and, and far enough in advance that we can really be inclusive to your point earlier about FEI starting where you said, okay, wait a minute, we don't have a full list to now, like, wait a minute, we've, we've opened up the floodgates here. Like there is a lot more talent here than what we knew. And if we can remember that talent is actually equally distributed, opportunity is not. So there's nothing in science that, that proves that talent isn't distributed in all races and all right sorts of things but there's something about our mindsets that tells us like oh maybe not so we've got to be able to challenge that well we're we're all comfortable in in the things that we've done for years right and and the practices and you know uh, all of those sorts of things and and you have to be willing to be uncomfortable you have to be willing to uh to reach out and and make connections and and uh you know, be, be open to um, having difficult conversations sometimes. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's incredibly important. Um, switching gears to uh, uh, the, the uh, devastation in the community uh, as a result of, uh, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, here in the Twin Cities, rebuilding costs to the tune of $500 million or more. If, Tawana, if you could influence the rebuilding in a way that optimizes inclusive growth, I mean, beyond the obvious goals of employing a diverse and inclusive workforce to enable that growth and the rebuilding, what are the kinds of issues and things you think we should be thinking about front and center? What should we be thinking first about in connection with the rebuild? Well, you asked me my magic question of the moment, George. Um, that the rebuilding is so significant and I've heard numbers that are now looking like they could be up closer to a billion dollars and that's simply for the bricks and mortar not actually even getting up into the business right the internal business and, and closing any of the gaps that business owners have experienced while being closed over the last year off and on and 
one of the things that's important to note when it comes to racial inclusion in that formula is that many of the business owners impacted do not own the business infrastructure they're in, the buildings that they're in. Owning is not the right solution for everyone, but owning often gives you that opportunity to build wealth, to be in control of some decisions around you that you're not in control of as a tenant. And without some significant amount of business and property ownership starting to occur more deeply in our communities of color, we will not begin to close those wealth gaps. And so my magic wand says, those who are in positions to invest in that rebuilding that has to occur for the sake of our entire region and economy have to be thinking about how we transfer ownership, how we think about that transfer of wealth and power and not from a, oh wait, this is sad and bad, but because wealth has been extracted wealth and land and property have been extracted from African-American and Native American people in these cities historically without repair, without repair, without returning that wealth historically. And while I believe it was a headline just yesterday focused on the city of St. Paul now considering reparations, we are doing a contract with the county of Ramsey County right now on a 10 year economic competitiveness and inclusion plan that is also thinking about how the wealth that has been extracted out of communities might be restored, but that hasn't been done to date. We have an opportunity as we think about business ownership and property ownership, and we recognize that we already have people coming in from other cities who know our city has been damaged and therefore it is ready for the taking and ready for the buying. We have an opportunity to say, wait, that's not what we want to have happen. We already have business owners here. We could be in position to say, as we repair, we also repair and restore and we restore wealth here. That requires intentionality. It requires being dri driven by our values, but it's possible. And it's possible by thinking about the long-term. And that's my core goal. It's why our, our organization is focusing on for the next two months and on through the year, a reckoning with racism in order to rise together. And we're elevating just this Friday, a series, um, a documentary that we produced that highlights the work of businesses who were impacted by both COVID-19 and by the reckoning with racism and the uprisings that took place after George Floyd's murder so that we can begin those conversations as a community about what does it take to not just recover our economy because recovery assumes that the economy we had before COVID-19 was good and inclusive and it wasn't. So we don't wanna recover, we don't wanna go back there. We want to repair and reimagine an economy that actually works and that requires some tough conversations. It requires talking about what's the future look like and what do we want it to look like and how do we create that? And knowing it's possible, more than that, what I would say is in 2008, the economy all over the country crashed and people went about solution building in creative ways or not so creative ways. The Urban Institute studied in 2018 cities all across America, 274 cities, to say how well did they recover? What did they do to recover? and how inclusive was that recovery? St. Paul and Minneapolis scored 272nd and 273rd out of 274 cities for <sighs> racial inclusion in that recovery because we went about it from a perspective of simply economic recovery. And we did quite well with economic recovery, one of the best in the country. With the speed at which our economy got back to normal, housing prices got back to normal, businesses were back going great, wonderful. But to the point of everything we've talked about so far, communities of color only fell further behind than they were. We have a chance now to say, wait a minute, we're already doing great. Actually, we're doing really well right now with COVID-19 economic recovery. We have a chance to pause and say, what do we wanna to do to be very intentional? And I'm convinced that this piece around business and property ownership is at the heart of ensuring that we don't just do recovery, but we do reimagining in ways that we can afford to do. We're, we're one of the great economies of our country. We can afford to not take risk, but to be intentional about investment. 
Well, Anna, we've, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left and uh, there, there's a couple different questions I, I wanna get to. Uh, but I wanna, the first one I wanna build off of, uh, you know, the, the wealth gap, right? Wealth accumulation uh, oftentimes means uh, property accumulation. Uh, you know, I'm a homeowner. Many of the people on the calls are on the, on the Zoom are uh, homeowners. But I don't know that many of us and, and we probably all know that there is a gap, right? But give us some information about the statistics about the level of the gap between home ownership in communities of color and home ownership in predominantly white communities and what that then drives for economic inclusion, advancing economic. Absolutely. It's interesting the um, statistics for Minneapolis St. Paul, we focused, we launched really hard into the wealth gap last year. Um, and yet there is not a strong analysis or study on the wealth gap in Minneapolis St. Paul. And so it's a, a study we want to do here this year. But what we do know is that by closing the wealth gap in the United States, we add significant dollars into this economy here. And I'm gonna pull the study and put a link into um, the chat, but we add significant dollars and McKinsey actually studied this and in the, are, are in the midst of launching a new institute that I'm gonna serve on the advisory board for um, at McKinsey Global. I'm specifically focused on closing the wealth gap between black and white Americans. Um, and more than that, what I would say is we know that the wealth gap because it's tied to property ownership also was not accidentally caused but incentivized by our federal government and its decisions to say that white people could buy homes and African-Americans could not with the GI Bill. And so it's important to acknowledge that we didn't get to a wealth gap because some people chose to say, okay, I don't wanna buy a house and I do wanna buy a house, but we got to the wealth gap in large part, both from slavery and because when people had opportunities to be able to thrive, our government said, I want to incentivize some families to be able to move forward and other families not to be able to move forward. If you've been a part of presentations with Mapping Prejudice, they make it really clear in Minneapolis, which parts of Minneapolis were actually covenanted to say, these families cannot purchase homes and these families can even when coming back into the communities after the war and thinking that, okay, wait a minute, sure, we can take advantage of this, we can thrive. Oh, actually you cannot. And again, that wealth extraction and yet promoting for other families, they're just about to finish the same data for St. Paul, it'll be done in April. And it's important for us to understand that history because that history has continued to accelerate when we think about how wealth has accumulated family by family. My own family, um, my great grandparents being homeowners in Oklahoma is how I began to live my life and come up forward. But every family didn't have that same thing. And certainly before that, my own family did not. We have to acknowledge that when we think about all of the disparities that exist today, as opposed to thinking about the starting point being the poverty that we're experiencing today, and then think about what does it do to our economy if we close those wealth gaps for everyone at this stage? Yeah, imagine the, the family out there that, um, you know, uh, if, if there are uh, both, both a father and a, and a mother in the family uh, and, and they're renting as opposed to owning uh, their home, uh, what, what did their uh, parents do? What did their grandparents do? Some of those sorts of issues. And, and it becomes normative, right? It, beca it, it becomes, well, I'm just gonna do what you know, my family has done in the past, right? What everyone around me seems to be doing as well. And, and so, uh, and so when, when you take those societal issues and you compound them with, uh, with actual discriminatory issues that have baked, and racist issues that have been baked into some of the laws and the, and the, the practices, it's, it's no wonder that we are where we are. And so it, it will take intentionality, I think, in order to, uh, to change that. And, and thank you for sharing the, the McKinsey report. We've got about six minutes left. And, and Tawana, we've talked about you know, all of these big, big issues. I'm gonna talk about you for a little bit here. <laughs> you know, you're, you're obviously a leading voice in Minnesota. We're, we're so blessed that you, you uh, came to the Twin Cities to help launch this initiative. What's inspired you in, in your work? You know, uh, what, what have been some of the thinkers, the artists, uh, the, the books, uh, spiritual path and so forth that, that, um, it, that you uh, are informed by when, when, you, when you wake up every day? That is a great question. Um, 
I, it was, uh, you know, it, those of you who are on Facebook know that Facebook gives you your memories, um, uh, which is helpful because I have a good memory, but sometimes uh, dates escape me. And Facebook informed me that it was this week, four years ago, that I asked a group of about 15 people to come with me to Chicago to um, meet with um, uh, Case um, uh, Chicago, World Business Chicago, um, Chicago Anchors for a Sustainable Economy, uh, Chicago uh, Metropolitan Planning Council, um, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, and several other organizations. Because at that point, I did not know for sure that I would create a new organization, but I knew we needed something drastically different than we have here today. And I ended that trip convinced uh, of exactly what we needed to do. And thankfully, several of those folks uh, said yes to being on the journey with me. And uh, I still partner deeply with uh, Mary Sue Barrett and her organization in Chicago and several others um, and organizations, chambers of commerce and economic development organizations across the country um, who work with myself and uh, my Brookings colleagues uh, to really study what works and what doesn't work and, and specifically how we dismantle the way we're used to doing things to your point earlier like we have to acknowledge sometimes like, wait a minute, that was wrong, that I thought that worked. And I'm a person who's led organizations like that in other cities. Um, but to say like, wait, that that worked then, but I was leading that for an or for a community that wasn't very racially diverse. Um, I wasn't trying to get equitable outcomes. I was just trying to grow the economy. So that was successful, but that wasn't successful for everybody. So now I need to do something different to get a different set of results. And so um, I'm inspired by um, constantly pushing myself to look at those options. I'm inspired by um, businesses who are challenging themselves to, to work differently. So I nothing gives me more excitement than when a leader calls and says, I, I didn't get it when you talked to me a year ago, but now I picked it back up and now I get it. I'm inspired by after George Floyd was killed, some of my neighbors, um, I'm not an outdoors person, as you can hear me wheezing, my asthma hates the outdoors um, and all seasons of Minnesota. But some of my neighbors talked to my husband and said, like, we've got to meet her. We heard about her organization and it turned into some amazing front porch conversations, um, just amazing that are just about the everyday life of um, how we get across our racial lines and our economic lines and build relationships that foster inclusion. And I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by my team every day who do this hard work behind the scenes um, that you don't often get the credit for, um, uh, but are willing to do it because they know it pays off in generations. I'm inspired by policymakers like those um, uh, at our counties and cities who are doing heavy lifting that will pay off in generations. Sometimes we think things are paying off because we're in the news, um, but this work is about my kids' grandkids and your kids' grandkids. Um, uh, it really, we see like surface level benefits, but we're really trying, because we're undoing generations worth of stuff, we're trying to get benefits that will be in generations. And so when I see those leaders who are much better than I am at brokering um, solidarity behind the scenes, uh, that is uh, so admirable to me. And they have values and, and traits that I admire and try to learn from. Um, many of whom I'm sure are on this call as well, business leaders who are quiet storms in their own right. Um, and have navigated this community for years and teach people like me how to do so um, when folks seem like they won't move and you want to push them over tomorrow, um, but you got to wait and keep working with them and teaching and, and asking and learning together in order to get the job done that none of us can do this alone. We have to go together. Um, that is uh, one of the most inspiring things possible for a person like me who has such urgency about this work, but realizes we have to get there together. Well, Tawana, we're just about at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the top of the hour here. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Uh, it's, it's been an incomparable treat for me personally, uh, and I've heard you speak a number of different times, uh, but uh, re really appreciate you, you sharing these thoughts about how to build an economy that works for all of us uh, uh, today, uh, we, we have, uh, we have a, a, a wonderful group of, of people in the audience, NACD members, FEI members, strategic partners, guests, and uh, I can't imagine that any of them didn't walk away with, with a number of great ideas about how to, um, how to move the ball forward and, and uh, help to build an inclusive economy along with you. So thank you once again. Thank you, uh, I will give you a quick uh, shout out again, uh, Reckoning to Rise. Could you mention that for just a moment and then we'll sign off? 
Absolutely. Our series starts this Friday, Reckoning to Rise Together. It will be at noon on Friday. You can register on our website, centerforeconomicinclusion.org, and then every Thursday at noon in February, and we would love for you to join us. Thank you. And then uh, on behalf of NACD, for those of you who are NACD members, please do fill out the survey. The link was in the chat, uh, the chat box. Uh, we appreciate that because a portion of the local chapter's funding does come from uh, the completion of those surveys. Oh, and I see another copy of the chat link just came up. So again, thank you so much, Tawana. Thank you to our uh, uh, members, guests, strategic partners and others who joined us today, please join us at our next FEI or NACD event. Thank you once again, have a great day.